Sustainability is a great pledge, but there are often questions about how it will work, whether there will be not just the supply of it, the demand for it, and whether the greater demand for sustainability will lead to uh, profits as well as more verification. Um, the RSPO is a good place to start. Um, I'm going to give each speaker seven minutes, but I want to start with my good friend, Dato Del Weber, and really, they've been a pioneer in trying to create a, a certification process which really started in our region uh, in response to the growth of the industry. In the time the RSPO has been around, uh, Indonesia has become the world's largest uh, producer of palm oil. Palm oil itself has grown so dramatically. So very early on, they have tried to really bring together the different stakeholders to discuss this issue of sustainability. So we can start with Daryl to share his experiences with us about this effort. Daryl, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Simon. Thank you to the organizers for allowing me to participate in this very uh, grand event in this very grand place and in a very significant part of Southeast Asia, Singapore. Uh, well, I'm very tempted to go on and talk for half an hour, but I'm limited to seven minutes. So just a bit of a blurb about RSPO so you know the context. We were formed in 2004 on the back of a regional issue that came up, which is the haze, the regional haze, on the back of the Millennium Development Goals that were signed in the year 2000, on the back of concerns on biodiversity loss and deforestation. So a very uh, forward-thinking group of people came together. They knew that the industry had a significant role to play in sustainable development in the world, but they also knew there were issues among some of, some of the players. So they came together thinking, how could they promote the good of this industry and mitigate the bad? And through that thinking, they brought together seven stakeholder groups, the producers, the processors and traders, consumer goods manufacturers, re retailers, um, social NGOs, environmental NGOs, and the financiers came together, sat down for the very first time, in most cases, sat down in a room and, and really hammered out, oh well, had very uh, robust conversations on, on just what was sustainable palm oil. So they came up with a standard in 2005 that defined what sustainable palm oil was according to these seven stakeholder groups. It was the first time a soft commodity did that, and uh, to many, it was a success. In the year 2008, the first certified sustainable palm oil came to the market. Today, 20% of all, well, 20% of all crude palm oil is considered certified sustainable according to the RSPO standards. Today, we have more than 2,000 members from more than 70 countries who are our members. Today, the largest companies in the world are our members, but also, more importantly, smallholder associations, uh, community-based organizations are also in our membership. Today, several countries support RSPO uh, as the only way to break, well, several countries support RSPO in that they make, they make pledges that by a certain date, a certain year, only certified sustainable palm oil according to the RSPO standards can be brought into the country. So we have achieved some measure of success. But I come back to, to this, this panel discussion. How is it relevant to Asia? How can we make it relevant to Asia? I think for quite some time, although the impacts of unsustainable development of this crop is felt in the region, we rely on other parts of the world to support the purchasing of sustainable palm oil, which I think we have to change. I do think that consumers in this part of the world, the very people who unsustainable development of palm oil affects tremendously, should rise up to the challenge and ask for sustainable palm oil in this region and not rely on the likes of Europe US, Australia, to make that demand. Sometimes I find when I talk to Singaporeans or Malaysians or Indonesians, they feel helpless to solve this huge problem of, say, the haze or deforestation. 
I think not. I think there is extreme power in the hands of every individual in Singapore. I think the very fact that Singapore is a financial hub for this industry, is a, is a trading hub for this industry, and probably consumes a very, well, and probably on a per capita basis, has a large consumption, well, consumes a large amount of palm oil. Mainly because, like other Asians, you like your fried foods, but also because you're a high-income nation and you consume a lot of processed foods. So, there is a role to be played, and I've been in this game quite a while already, to know that there is a role for everyone. I know this through experience in several countries, in, say, the Netherlands, where industry and consumers have come together, and it's now almost mainstream in the Netherlands. I know it can happen in Singapore, it can happen in Indonesia, and it can happen in Malaysia. We have a role. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. A uh, good introduction to an organization that's been pioneering in the sector of palm oil. Bother about certification, but the importance of being multiple stakeholders. And a kind of challenge to Singapore and other cities to really feel that kind of ownership and uh, leverage over these issues. I'm very pleased to tell Daryl that uh, this year, especially we have various banks and financial institutions here, as well as regulators, and I think uh, a number of uh, representatives from large consumer uh, companies like uh, NTUC Fairprice. So I think uh, with the uh, attention, uh, there will be more awareness and hopefully then more action. And our SWA has played a small role in this. Uh, some of you might see in the foyer a small exhibition in the corner. Last year, we had the first public exhibition in one of our biggest uh, shopping malls uh, to really bring this awareness home of what consumers can do. Um, so uh, my next speaker is another Singapore-based company, Nesty. Oil has really uh, been a pioneer here, bringing new technologies in to really uh, use supplies of various biofuels and palm oil to uh, uh, do its own business. Uh, and then along the way to try to meet sustainability standards. Here we're very happy to have Adrian Soharto, the manager for sustainability of Nestle Oil. Adrian, would you like to Thank go you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for the kind invitation and also the opportunity to speak among everybody here. It's always good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, this is the month for sustainability conferences, I guess. So we've seen a lot of people in the same conferences here and there. <clears throat> so um, first, I think uh, I'll start the usual. Um, I'll explain why we are, we are Nestle and we're not Nestle. And we're not part of Nestle that sells um, biofuels. Uh, so Neste is actually a Finnish majority government-owned company. We're basically uh, basically an oil and gas company. We ventured into biofuels in around 2005. That was when the first idea came out. And um, we've been operating since 1940s. And we always say, you know, when we start operating oil and gas in 1940s, we didn't have a lot of attention on us. But when we start buying palm oil in the uh, 2000, suddenly a lot of NGOs put a lot of eyes on us. And we kind of like, oh, which is more sustainable? But you know, having said that, uh, so basically, um, we are a majority producer of oil and gas, but uh, about 10% of our business is uh, biofuels. Our biofuels um, is, a, is a different industry than the other manufacturing industry. Biofuels is actually a highly regulated industry. So sustainability in biofuel is actually within the government regulations in EU and the US. And then that's we sell to countries based on mandates. So certification for us is not a luxury, it's a compulsory thing. So we cannot, uh, without certification, we can't sell our products. So um, we buy a lot of CPO. Uh, to date, 2014, in our annual report, we reported 0 0.96 million tons of CPO are bought by a company from Indonesia and Malaysia and 100% are certified, both by RSPO and ISCC. We're very proud to be the first oil and gas company, uh, which is an RSPO member. So how did this journey begin? Well, when we came in the market in 2005 and started looking around, we realized not a lot of people are certified. So, and we didn't want to be the one that is like um, dictating what it's supposed to be. So we uh, started doing a kind of a partnership so we, we look into progressive suppliers and then we start partnering them. For us, um, we see that uh, the first, when ISCC, when the EU regulation came out in 2008, uh, we approached some suppliers and we said like, you know, we'll help you certify, we'll buy your product. And after that we see 
from 0% certification to 100% certification. But we see the journey is basically, um, uh, how do we achieve sustainability? We always say, first, it requires a good partnership with everybody, uh, which means that we have to partner suppliers, we have to um, tell them, that, you know, uh, basically, what do you need to be certified, um, we understand what is the impediments, and then we partner governments, we see what is the regulations, and we see how we can help governments to reach that certification. And we, then we see for NGOs and also civil societies, because there are some things that we don't know which is happening on the ground, and next day or we don't have people on the ground, and having to talk to them, we can see what is, uh, needs to be done. And also, we also monitor market trends for sustainability. For example, um, where, what, is the, what do our consumers want? Apparently our consumers uh, a few years ago said that we don't want anything related to deforestation in the supply chain. So we launched a sustainability commitment, we launched a no deforestation commitment. And then um, they also wanted smallholders, and now we can proudly say that 40,000 smallholder families are supplying to su our suppliers, who in turn are supplying to us certified um, palm oil. So I'll go back to, uh, I'll strengthen what uh, Daryl has said. Um, I think the most important thing in this context is how we can drive sustainability in Asia. In Indonesia and Malaysia, we've seen a bit of uh, uh, changes, uh, quite ha happened a few years ago. Indonesia issued the Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil System, the Malaysian issues the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil System, and I think there's a big role to play as Singapore as a trading hub. Singapore is a huge trading hub, uh, same um, as you know the, what Daryl said about Netherlands as well. There's a role that can be played here to, to make sure that you know everything that is purchased and traded is also sustainable. And I think from that way we can start changing the supply chain and also we no start noticing changes around Asia because um, we see that even the producers are doing something so maybe there's something can be done with the traders as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll probably end it there, and then we'll just ask for a discussion later. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sarato. May I ask you a question very quickly? Um, you said you're not on the ground. Certificates matter so much to you. What does Nesty do if and when an NGO or foreign government in Europe far away raises a specific issue? How, what is the process for making sure that these issues aren't just a protectionism uh, and you know, uh, are truly verified? Um, first, we ask the question, of course, who, how, where, when it is. That's the most important thing because somebody can say like, oh, we're concerned about deforestation, but we said like, what kind of forest, where it was, what kind of the accusation, all of that. And we're very happy as well that because um, RSPO has a very robust system and they have, a, for example, a grievance panel. So if the, if we, if the findings are valid, and usually what we do is we contact the NGO, we find out as well, and then we do contact our networks on the ground. If it's one of our suppliers, then we'll ask our suppliers. If it's found to be true, then we will go through the, as an RSPO member, we will go through the RSPO grievance panel for this. And then um, obviously there will be some process to do and then um, there will be clarification of what really happens. So you bought into the system and you use the system. Great, uh, let's move on to the next uh, panelist, Mr. Muhadi Tantra, the CFO, Deputy Managing Director for Green Forest Product and Technology. Can uh, you share with us briefly what Green Forest does and as well as the efforts they're making to more, move towards uh, FSC? Muyade, please. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Simon Tay, and uh, to the organizer, thank you for having me as one of your panelists. Uh, let me first introduce Green Forest because we are uh, relatively unknown among the giant companies here. Uh, we've been in the business of exporting mangrove, uh, starting with log and then eventually wood chips and charcoal uh, for 45 years now. We started off in Riau, Sumatra, and there, thereafter we expanded in the 1988 to West Papua, and uh, mid-90s uh, we expanded again to West Kalimantan. Now we only have the active site at both the West Papua site and West Kalimantan site. Now we export mainly to Taiwan and a little bit of China. Japan used to be our largest buyer, however they shy away from buy, buying uh, mangrove wood chips uh, due to perceived uh, environmental uh, concern. But uh, this is actually a totally unjustified uh, case. Anyway, um, we are the largest mangrove forest management enterprise in the world. And largest doesn't mean that, you know, anything because we're the one of two left in the world, I think. <laughs> so, 
The other one, the, the only other one that we know of is in the Malaysia, in the Perak uh, state, Matang uh, Forest uh, Reserve. That's about 40,000 hectare in size. Our size is 110,000 hectare, uh, 82,000 hectare in Bintuni, and about uh, 28,000 hectare in West Kalimantan. So we have this uh, vision that in order for us to be able to justify ourselves to the world, uh, we need to get some sort of certification done. So we've been going after FSC Pure, and this is not control wood, FSC Pure certification uh, since 2000, 2012. Uh, the one in West Kalimantan, we actually have passed the man assessment that, is, that was done in January of 2015. So the final report's done, so we're just waiting for the administ administrative work to be done so that we can get the actual certificate itself any day now. Uh, the one in the West Papua, we are still having to resolve some of the major cars, so we are having another round of main assessment done later part of this month. So if all good goes smoothly, we should be able to get a certification done also in October of this year, um, so that both of our concession will be FSC pure certified. And if we get that, I think we are the, probably the only one in the pulp and paper industry that have FSC pure certification in Southeast Asia. So to be complete, we also have acacia plantation. Although it's only 9,000 hectare big, it's the third smallest plantation in Indonesia. But we're proud to say that even though we're small, we're one of only three acacia plantation that has FSC control wood certificate back in the time when we got it in 2012. So if all of the of these are done will be all FSC certified. So lastly, we also want to uh, um, thank uh, the TBI, the Borneo Initiative, and uh, World Wildlife Fund for actually sponsoring all this uh, initiative to get FSC certification, if any of them are here. Um, and going forward uh, for the company, we're also engaged in some progressive uh, research initiatives, uh, working with uh, various organizations like C4, uh, National University of Singapore, Nanyang Technology University as well, in the area of uh, climate change, carbon, basically related. Uh, we have installed one of the largest installations of RSET in any private company, that's a service elevation uh, uh, table. Um, we have 24 installed now in uh, our site in uh, West Papua, and uh, as well as renewable energy research, uh, so that we don't have to uh, rely on diesel anymore to run the, our place. Okay, so let me also introduce a bit about mangrove. Um, you don't usually associate mangrove with something productive, something that you can use for large-scale industry work, but it is actually a very productive forest. Uh, FAO has stated that um, the growth rate for mangrove forests can be nine to 10 cubic per hectare per year. If you convert that to dry ton, it's about eight ton per hectare per year, and that's a pretty decent number. And unfortunately, Indonesia has lost a lot of the mangrove forest. Um, currently in 2010, I think the estimate is 3.1 million hectare left. Uh, 1989, it was 4.1 million hectare, so we're losing at a rate of 50,000 hectare per year. So 50,000, if you, every two years, we lost our concession, essentially, uh, in Indonesia. And is it because of logging? No, more than 90% is because it got converted into other use whether it's airport, hotel, but majority of which are actually converted to shrimp pond that is not done sustainably. And for every kilogram of those farm shrimp pond, you're essentially consuming 10 kilogram of mangrove, one to 10 ratio or even more. So we exported 33,000 ton to Japan in 2012, farm shrimp. Essentially, Japan is consuming 330,000 tons dry weight of mangrove every year. If you convert that to carbon emission, CO2 emission, that's 5.8 million carbon CO2, equivalent to driving 1.2 million cars. That's how much impact it has. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about FSC uh, before the time runs out. So why do we want FSC certification to justify sustainability? Because to us, sustainability is the ability to prove to the world that we can extract value out of certain natural resource without jeopardizing the value, the potential value in the future. 
And that is basically require, require us to balance between economic value as well as the social impact, as well as the environmental impact. If you look at the FSC principle, it aligned to all those three things, okay, except principle number 10, which is uh, concerning plantation. And somehow, there's a lot of perception, especially in Asia, being a farming community, that plantation is more sustainable than natural forest utilization. And that is really sad because it is not always the case. I'm not against plantation. We have plantation ourselves. But in the case of plantation, you have to convert a certain forest into a monoculture forest. In terms of natural forest utilization, if you do it right and you do it sustainably, you are essentially keeping everything the same. But if you go to Japan and you try to sell something from natural forest, they say, no, 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 don't come. But if you say something from plantation, they say, oh, 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 that's good, that's sustainable. And I think we have to change that. And it requires government bodies to also favor some sort of natural forest utilization, not just favoring plantation in terms of taxation and a lot of professional fund and things like that. And FSC is actually aligned with that. So that's why we actually much favor FSC, although they got a lot of problem uh, in Asia especially um. because they are not supporting plantation. So I think overall what I want to convey is that there has to be a balance. There has to be a balance in uh, Asia in terms of favoring not just plantation but also try to figure out what to do best with what nature already gave us. My Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I move on to our fourth, but certainly uh, not last speaker in a sense, um, David Q, the President for Communication Sustainability for Global Markets of Unilever. Last year, uh, Unilever's Chief Operating Officer, Harish Manwani, gave one of the keynotes. He's clearly been a leader in trying to move to sustainability through his entire supply chain. David, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Simon. Um, so I thought I'd focus my comments on uh, three areas. So first, I think a little bit of a global update on our progress uh, on our sustainable living plan. And then second, I think focusing a little bit more on uh, how sustainability has driven the business. And then third, I think focusing on this idea of uh, certification and labeling. So uh, on our sustainable living plan, we, we announced our plan in 2010. So it's uh, pretty much four years into a 10-year plan. Uh, at the time that we announced the plan, we had three big targets. One was to have 1 billion uh, people's health and hygiene improved. Uh, one was to have 100% uh, of our agricultural raw materials sourced sustainably. Uh, and three was to decouple our growth from our environmental uh, impact. So uh, about a week ago, we launched a sort of fourth year progress update of the plan. Uh, we've now reached about 400 million people through our programs in health and hygiene. So for example, we run the uh, biggest children's hand-washing program uh, in schools in the world with more than 180 million children that we've reached through that. So we've reached about 400 million, uh, quite uh, well on our way to the 1 billion target. For sustainable sourcing, we've reached 55% uh, of our agricultural raw materials sustainably sourced now, uh, including palm oil. Uh, so it was also about halfway in our target. Uh, and then finally, on our environmental footprint, we've uh, halved or more than halved our, our own manufacturing footprint uh, in water, in greenhouse gas, in, in waste. Uh, so th those measures, I think, we've been doing uh, not too badly uh, for being four years into the journey. Now, when I turn to the business case, I think uh, that's where there's been a lot of interest. Is it really... Uh, driving the business performance? Is it driving growth? Is it driving profitability? Is it making a real impact on the business? Uh, and this year, the focus of our, our, our report has been about the business case. And I'm glad to say that it has provided uh, very strong data points around how it's driven the business. So we, we've defined now, uh, among our 400 brands, what we call sustainable living brands. So brands that have a social purpose embedded in them, brands like Dove, Lifebuoy, Ben & Jerry's, and brands that have a sustainable living product. So at least 10% of their product uh, sales must come from uh, products that are sustainable. And these brands account last year for more than 50% of our growth. Uh, so there's a huge amount uh, for us. More importantly, they also have uh, more than 2% percentage points more profitable than the average. 
So they are accounting for more than half the growth. In fact, they're growing uh, more than twice the company average, and also they are more profitable. And that's been a, a sort of a tremendous data point for us uh, internally to demonstrate uh, that it is driving performance of the business. Uh, and in fact, over the last four years, we've also had uh, a lot of cost savings. We've saved more than 200 million euros uh, out of our costs uh, through sustainability initiatives. So that's, that's the, um, the business case portion. Now, then, when I then turn to sort of the, the question uh, today around certification, labeling, um, and, and sort of where we stand on that, I think we are not for mandatory labeling. So I think that there is a time and place for labeling, but mandatory labeling, I think, uh, is, is too, too much of a blanket, uh, and it imposes often uh, penalties that are unintended consequences on SMEs, for instance, which then have to comply with very uh, expensive sometimes, very burdensome sometimes, uh, regulation and measures. So we, I, I think that there is a place for, for labeling, and we have uh, FSC, we have Reinforced Alliance, we have RSPO, we have Fair Trade, and we do do that, and, and they serve a purpose for being sort of a trust mark for our brands. Um, but by and large, I think we, we are more for, uh, you know, looking at in a particular place, in a particular market, for a particular product, uh, what is the role and purpose of labeling? Uh, and then, you know, going uh, sort of by that. Um, and what we found that works, actually, is, is not so much uh, sustainability for its own sake, but being able to communicate that uh, together with the functional benefits of our products. So if you look at responsible consumption, which is a very sort of big umbrella uh, statement for products that are organic or ethical, natural, uh, and, and sustainable, that now accounts for 15% uh, of sales uh, in grocery in the United States. And it's growing, it's the fastest growing segment on the market. So it's actually becoming very much mainstream, not only in, in, in Europe and the United States, but also in Asia. How do we then make that even more mainstream? It's not by actually creating a niche, but it's actually by creating it uh, as part and parcel of why we buy a product. So if you go into a supermarket and you want to buy a shampoo, you're never going to buy a shampoo that is sustainable but doesn't work. You know, you're going to buy a shampoo that makes your hair soft and silky, that addresses your dandruff problem, that, uh, that works for you, and that works at a price point uh, that you can afford and that makes sense for you. And then you're going to look for whether it's sustainably sourced or, or, or manufactured. And, and for companies like us, I think the trick is to create products that work that are at the right price point for you, and that are also sustainable. And what we found is if we do that right, we can actually uh, make that more profitable and, and sort of drive our growth. So I'll leave uh, my comments at that. Uh, thank you. Look forward to the dialogue. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes for the question and answer discussion. A number of questions already come in from the uh, box. And I guess one of them is really about the consumer hand. Um, how do you all respond to the possibility that uh, consumers might only take up Daryl Weber's uh, challenge to drive the issue, but boycott products, that banks might uh, really scrutinize uh, loans and uh, 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 you know, investments? Um, how do you sort of hit this off? In connection to that, while a number of you talked about the supply of certification, what's the demand like? I mean, what are the barriers to more and more companies uh, picking it up? Uh, do they want uh, to, uh, is there a demand for it, basically? So David, uh, Unilever's products have suffered uh, from boycotts before. Um, how do you feel that the sustainability efforts, etc., might you know, forestall these, etc.? No, I, I, I think there's a role for consumer associations and NGOs and consumer groups to play to push companies, uh, including companies like us, to move faster. Uh, and, and I think you know, boycotts are obviously is one. Uh, way to do that. I think it's also about being, uh, making informed choices. So and that's one of the important roles that certification and labeling can play. Helping our consumers to make informed choices about what they're buying. And there's a lot of demand and, and uh, you know, consumers are crying out for that really. Uh, they want to know how their products are made, where their products come from, the company behind the brands. 
Uh, and that's pushed a lot of uh, consumer companies, not only in our space, but in the apparel sector, in the uh, consumer electronics sector, to be more transparent about their supply chains, to be uh, you know, more open about where they source from and, and how they manufacture and sort of their practices. So I think that, that's a lot of that has been driven by uh, you know, consumer groups and NGOs uh, and, and boycotts being sort of one route. Um, but I think it's also you know, about helping consumers to make informed choices. So can I ask the same question in a different way? You often don't deal with the direct consumer, but you deal with the uh, government regulations and the purchasers. Uh, and you, you've said earlier you respond to these problems that arise. But how do you drive it so that it becomes more transparent from your supply chain? How do you make efforts to really um, look at what your suppliers are doing? Uh, that's a very good question. I think uh, um, I agree with David. It's uh, basically... Um, everybody has a role to play and we, for us, um, uh, it's a good until today, thank God, that we have not, never been boycotted. Uh, but I think uh, the most important thing is actually to, for us, is to read what the consumer wants beforehand and also to have dialogues with NGOs and civil societies regularly because from there we, we have a feeling what is the issues, what is the issues that we overlooked because we don't actually have any operations on the ground. Uh, what are things that we can do, what are things that we can push to our suppliers. And for our suppliers as well, uh, it's, we are lucky enough, I could say lucky enough, but actually it's a, it's a requirement for us to, to have um, transparency in means of like supply chain from all traceable all the way to the estates um, as a regulation. And we also even calculate the greenhouse gas emissions of all our products. That's also compulsory. But what we're, we're asking now is because consumers have been asking to see, for example, is there any products when, the, when your product is made, is it mixed with anything that could have caused deforestation? So now we're, we're pushing our suppliers to see, uh, to actually actively do that. And we're, we're glad to say that um, all our suppliers have announced a similar policy towards, to us. But so the bottom line, I think, is uh, basically it's about dialogues, about engaging, and, um, and also to read the market and read the trends before it actually happens. Okay. So comments on this side? Yeah, I, um, I think with regards to the consumer, we have to be able to get the consumer to feel or have a re uh, be able to relate to what it means when they buy something that's unsustainable, right? So, for example, when the haze hit Singapore, that's, I guess, when Singaporeans start to realize that they do care about what's happening in Indonesia, <laughs> right? It, it, because if you don't see the impact to you, why? You know, just buy the cheaper one or buy the best shampoo that can make your hair looks nicer. And uh, same thing with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, example you can put out there, like uh, I just gave an example about shrimp, but most Japanese will not understand that when they eat shrimp, farm shrimp, that from Saudi, they, Southeast Asia, they are impacting the mangrove forest. And when they impact the mangrove forest, they do impact the carbon emission and climate change connect us all, right? We breathe the same air around the world, and sea level will rise and impact us all. But if the consumer can feel that, can understand that, I think we have a better chance of uh, getting them to buy something that's sustainable. Well, the question I was trying to ask you is basically, do you find in your products there is actually demand for FSC certified? Is there a price premium or not? Uh, yes. Um, I think there's a price premium. We actually been promised 5% increase in price uh, once we get the FSC Pure certification. I think it could be more than that. Yeah. Good, thank you. Daryl, RSBO, while I admire it, I've actually spoken as one of your keynote speakers in one of your early roundtables. Um, you come under a lot of pressure uh, in the last two years. Um, others on the panel do believe in your system. Um, how would you describe your ability to have the grievances really work out basically on your own members, because in a way they are your owners, but yet they are subject to your disciplines. Is, well, how do you do the tensions there? Well, I live for the tensions. That's why I accumulate the gray hair and I lose the black hair. Um, it's the way the RSPO has been created. They, it is a deliberate way to create that tension so that we have a safe platform to raise the hard questions and therefore find the tough solutions. Now, it has never been our ambition to, to become a niche player. 
It's always been our ambition to be mainstream. And I think, although we welcome the tough questions, we also have to temper that with our ambitions to be a mainstream actor in transforming markets. Now, we do have a, a complaint system. And that's one of the key things people forget. People assume that what the RSPO brings to the table is a very credible standard. No, that's not the only thing. We bring to the table also a high degree of transparency for the industry that has never happened before until today probably is not happening in any industry in the world, for any commodity in the world. That's one. Second, we, have, we provide an alternative avenue to seek recourse from communities, from uh, negatively impacted stakeholders due to unsustainable development. Now, these are some of the things we bring forward. Uh, we, we add value, I guess, in this whole uh, industry development. Now, the criticisms, it's valid. We, the maximum we can do as a RSP organization is to terminate the membership of our members. That in itself is probably not going to be a big deal to some stakeholders, but I can assure you that the, the impact of being ostracized by a large organization of 2,000 members from 70 countries can be incredible. Yeah? Uh, we know companies who, who immediately on the threat of being terminated want to come back and undo all the wrongs, which is great. That's what we live for. There's no use to speak to the choir, preach the, to the choir, and convert angels. Absolutely no use. It's far better to dance with the devil and convert the devil to an angel at some point. Oh, so what we live for is to convert all these wrongdoings and make it all good. That's what we do. And I think we have seen that impact. We have seen companies who, you know, sometimes on the brink of being let out of the organization, have come back uh, to undo their wrongs. Now, we also have seen that many, many other organizations, including some of our detractors, rely on our transparency, rely on our reporting system, rely on our complaint system to put a spotlight on certain issues. You know, we know, we know there's many initiatives out there right now who support one or two or three companies but then, through our transparent system, through our complaint system, we also know that the commitments made does not necessarily translate to full on-the-ground implementation. And that's where our system comes in to put a spotlight to what's happening on the ground and ground it on reality. So I think uh, we have all these things going for us. And we, of course, have a lot of, uh, we, you know, we need to go a long way to improve our systems. But, uh, you know, we have, we have impacts. Daryl, I've got another question uh, for RSPO. I guess it's a marker of how important in this market the RSPO is. That the questions relate to, one, the startup in the last year or so of standards by Indonesia, the IPSO, as well as uh, Malaysia, where you're from. Um, how does RSPO see the creation of these national standards? Is it... Uh, detracting from RSPO's work, uh, diluting it? Is it confusing uh, consumers and upstream buyers? Related to that is a criticism, uh, which I'm not sure is fair, that RSPO is too expensive and too cumbersome so that only the larger players can really have certification of RSPO, whereas the smaller, small media enterprises we've talked about really will struggle to get uh, uh, their head around RSPO certification. Daryl, I want to emphasize, as friends, this is from the feedbox. I have not yeah, much yeah. control about this. <laughs> so, can you repeat the first one again? Sir? The first one, whether IPSO and uh, the Indonesian standard and Malaysian standard have impacted uh, yourself, uh, diluted the standard, and confused the market. So, well, let's talk about national standards. Um, on the, I think it was on the second day after the announcement, official announcement and launch of ISPO, I came out very clearly to say that ISPO is complementary to what RSPO does. Uh, simply because, you know, in the beginning people say that the bar of RSPO is too high. That's relative to the floor. The distance, the gap between the floor and the bar was too high. 
Now, with the implementation of ISPO, the floor raises, and it comes very close to the bar. So therefore, I think it's easier for now companies in Indonesia in general, if everybody goes on board the ISPO platform, will find it much easier to, to, to you know, jump over this bar called the RSPO. So I think it, it helps. It's complementary. Of course, there are, there are stakeholders who, who probably find it profitable to make a play that there's a war going on between ISPO and RSPO. I think uh, people see through that. Um, we now, you know, we have, uh, we have been working with ISPO to try and find ways where certification bodies can go down to the ground and do a single audit but issue two certificates, ISPO and RSPO. And how to do that is to understand the gaps. What, is the gap, what are the gaps between ISPO, Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil, and RSPO? Uh, at the end of the day, I would like to say also that, you know, it's... My, my, my team always tells me, and I think one of my team members is sitting at the back, they tell me, Daryl, you know, RSPO or any standard can create the best blue shirt in the world and claim we are the best blue shirt in the world. But the world wants a red shirt. So it's no use claiming that we are the best if we are not relevant to the world's markets. So all these other standards, I think, should have a firm grounding in understanding what the market wants, what understanding what the stakeholders want. And that's where I think there's a slight edge on the RSPO's perspective, because we have this large membership base, and we give voices to the seven key stakeholder groups who keeps us in check and reminds us of what is relevant in the world today. Just one more on Daryl. This is really for me, though. Oh, sorry. Um, the too expensive part I haven't answered. Yeah. And also connected to that, has any RSPO member since the start of the national standards dropped off RSPO and joined only the national standards? Uh, we've terminated some. Okay. And are these made known? I, I, can't, I can't recall, maybe, I, I can't recall where someone has voluntarily resigned because they thought ISPO was... Uh, and the cost issue for the SMEs. The cost issue. So... Um, we heard early on in the previous panel there are cost savings to be had. We know from our work with smallholders that smallholders improve their bottom line by something like 20% uh, after they get certified, mainly because they record things down better. They understand what the inputs are. And, and we know, we, so there is this, this gain to be had from certification. But I do admit that there is an upfront cost to it. And I think uh, that's something is that's dependent on the baseline of that company once they, when, when, when they start on this whole certification scheme. Are they already very competent in areas of sustainability or not competent? And that, and that comes to the cost. Another flaw or fallacy that I keep hearing is this cost is high, but when you investigate, a lot of the cost is to meet legal compliance. And I think that's slightly unfair to lump legal compliance into the cost of certification. I don't think that's uh, accurate. Um, questions from the floor? I see a hand right at the back. Uh, Gurmit Singh again? Yes. It's not you? Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, I, I was amused by that phrase from Dato about dancing with the devils. I wonder how much more dancing is going on on the certification issue. Because I remember the last summit you had here, there was a big debate about RSPO, and many of the business people were not in favor of RSPO. Now you, of course, are singing praises because it's your standard organization, you're the big boss. But my fundamental question remains to RSPO and FSC, how much do these certification schemes actually change the scene? Because many people claim it's consumer driven. But as you look at in terms of forestry, in Malaysia, for example, the Sarawak timber fellows don't care about certification because there's a huge market in China that doesn't care about certification. So my question comes back to timber and palm oil is, are you really driven by the market or are you trying to give a sort of premium to your products so that people will accept the certification. Because the biggest problem of timber was, most people were saying, I remember the old days in Rio first, that 
who is willing to pay a premium for Malaysian timber? If there's no premium, why should we have it certified? So my question still remains is, I see the big bricks here talking, saying, yeah, yeah, but are you really going all the way down and giving a premium to these products that are certified? And is it worth it for the consumer? Because many of the big consumers say, not worth certifying the price I get. For example, nobody in the world is willing to pay replacement costs for tropical timber. Similarly, nobody will pay the price for replacement palm oil, even in the bio biodiesel industry. Thank you, Gavin. I think there was a question in there. The question was, do you feel that um, your certificates have actually market value? Um, or, you know, with the other non markets that don't care about certification, there's so much demand, it doesn't matter. And not just RSPO, but perhaps the others too. You mentioned, for example, how certifications are critical to your business. Yeah. So, anyone would like to respond, or all of you would like to respond? I'll feel like Darryl. Take a first, first crack at it. Go ahead, Darryl. Um, so, Gurmit, thank you for the question. And, you know, I'm thick-skinned enough to know that it was with good intent that comment, stroke question was uh, sent out. Um, no, certification is not the answer to stopping all the problems in the world uh, with regards to development? Absolutely not. I see, and I've always said this since 10 years ago, that certification remains a stick to those, who, to those in the supply chain who don't comply with what people expect um, with regards to keeping the environment safe or keeping local communities happy. It is the stick. Because if you clear important forest, for example, uh, the market stops buying from you. That's the stick. And, that, and we all know, if we have children, a stick is not necessarily the best way to get good behavior. I think we also need, the world needs uh, a carrot for people to keep forests. Now, I appreciate the issue that deforestation is a global concern, simply because forest regulates, uh, provides oxygen to the world, regulates rainfall all over the world, and yet nobody pays for this service. So, whilst you may think deforestation, or you, we must make deforestation a global issue, we also should look at the socio-economic development of high forest nations and make it a global issue as well. The opportunity cost of keeping forest standing is huge in the face of palm oil. So yes, certification, we can wield the stick, sometimes effectively, sometimes less effectively, but we surely need a carrot to keep forest standing. And I think that I'm, I'm hopeful at the end of this year we'll see that carrot. Any other comments from anybody else on the panel on this? So I'll, I'll talk about um, from the timber industry standpoint, right? Yeah, um, to get the FSC certification, at least to us, is something of a right thing to do, right? Because we've been, in the past, just doing things right, just follow the regulation and we should be okay. And the reason why I say that is that getting the certification itself is to justify that our practices, justify to ourselves that our practices can last forever. We have our, uh, our uh, HPH license until 2052. So we have all means, we, you know, we are meaning to be able to sustain it at least that long and even longer, right? That's one thing because there are guidance within FSC certification that allows you to follow, if you follow their process, allows you to justify it to yourself that your management practice are aligned with sustainability practices. So secondly, the consumer part of it. Uh, consumer is fickle, right? And, and as I come back again to, to my first statement, if they don't feel the impact, they won't pay more for premium, whether you have the FSC chop or not. So somehow, some way, FSC as a body, and also uh, us all in the industry, need to educate the cust uh, consumer as to what sort of thing will that what sort of negative impact will come as a result of that? Thank you. Can I, can I, yeah, I'll, I'll just add two points. So I, I think it's a fallacy to say that we must be able to charge a premium all the time. So when I said that, you know, if you look at our sustainable living brands and they are 
two percentage points more profitable, it is not always because we can charge a premium for them. It is also because they are actually less expensive to make. So when we compress our deodorants and use a smaller canister, we save 25% aluminum. When we inject little bubbles of plastic into our packaging, to lightweight the packaging, we save on the plastic. So we can be more profitable by being more sustainable, not only by charging more. So that's the first thing. Then I think the second thing is, if you look at sort of the consumer journey, um, you know, it, the, the, the way we sort of see it is, we, we have our footprint, we have our handprint, and then we have our blueprint. And on the footprint side, it is all our own manufacturing operations, and of course, we need to make that sustainable. On the handprint side, it is really how do we use our brands to engage with consumers, to help educate consumers about choices that they make that can be more sustainable, more responsible, and, and uh, you know, the consumers don't accept anymore that they buy a pair of jeans and, and the worker that sews the jeans are paid less than a dollar a day working in unsafe conditions. Uh, they don't accept that anymore. So why should they accept that whatever they buy uh, is having a negative impact on the planet? So I think that's the handprint part of it. And then the blueprint part of it is where certification comes in working across the industry to create transformational change at an industry level. And that's where I think you know, we need to work with organizations like RSPO on certifying, on investing behind standards uh, that as much as possible can be consistent, harmonized, and, and um, so simple and efficient uh, so that not only big companies like us can benefit, but also small, small and medium-sized enterprises. Good. Um, Mr. Sarto, any last comments? If not, we'll close out the panel. Oh, sorry, I ran out of time. Yeah. Well, actually, um, for, for an essay, um, our market is, as, I, as I've been repeating several times, is fixed, it has to be regulated. But I think the story when we first came is when we first produced a few, it, we only r saw a few markets open for regulated sustainability, but eventually uh, more becomes um, available and then we can sell our products even further. But I think um, if you look into the nature certification, I, I like uh, David's first statement, you know, if you look into the RSPO standard itself, it's about transparency, so it's about actually managing forests well, it's about our community, no exploitations. Those should be standards of what companies should be doing anyway. It should not be something that people should be paying a premium for. I think premium is good, but it's not something that should be sustainable. It should be, should be so companies that are not doing those minimum standards should actually not be given benefit. So, um, you know, treating your communities well, supplying for smallholders, should be a regular um, uh, you know, practice for the company to do. That's what we believe. Thank you. I think clearly the panel has told us that eco certification is a reality. It doesn't necessarily come with a premium, but there are many problems in trying to supply the right kind of answers, um, but it is a fact that we have to deal with. Uh, so please join me in thanking them for their contributions to the discussion.